Okay, well, on to today's math. So, today's lecture is probably going to be even shorter than the last couple of them, so hope nobody is terribly disappointed by this. I do have a blurb on integration for the 690 students. Once we finish this, but I doubt that's going to take too long either, so... And we're still way ahead of schedule in this class, so I didn't feel the need to add a bunch of filler material. Um, I, well, I mean, there was the homework four that I added last week, and homework five, as I said, I'm probably going to try to post it in the next couple days. And I'm going to look at the schedule. If I can avoid having it due, like, directly after homework four, then I will, but... I also want to try to have everything graded before the next midterm, so I'll just see how the schedule goes. Well, I mean, if everybody would rather just have more time to do it, even if it means you don't need a grade before the midterm, then whatever. I mean, I may be able to just have it due like a week after homework five regardless. So I'll look at the schedule and try to figure it out, because I think... Oh, I'm trying to remember how I have this scheduled. The next midterm go through homework six. I'll put some due date. If we don't like it, we can change it. <laughs> what? Oh, I put November six. I think. Is that like a bad day? Yeah. I think I have a. Well, I mean, as I said, I'm happy to do the same thing that I did yeah. this time around, where we don't all have to take it at the same time. If you want to come in and take it a few days earlier or a few days later, I mean, and obviously if you have like another midterm in one of, in like 662 the same day, let me know about that, because I do not want to inflict that on you. Oh, uh, no, but right still. Yeah, we have, we're having one right now, though. Yeah. We're having an exam right this morning. Oh, the unimodal question, it was supposed to say, like, f of a greater than or equal to f of x greater than or equal to f of y, and I said something like f of a greater than or equal to x greater than or equal to f of x, something like that. It was the unimodal question that was wrong. So, but like I said, I would just download it again as the safest bet, unless you've already written on it or something. I'm sorry about all the typos in the homework. It's really depressing. I read through it like six times before I post it every time, and inevitably there is an error that I don't see. In my defense, the reason they're errors is because I'm typing, copying all the Cassell and Berger problems into the problem set so that people who didn't buy the book don't have to buy the book just to find out what the homework is. So, I'm trying to be a good professor here. <laughs> anyway, so as I said, today we are going to get a very brief introduction to the multinomial distribution and then a couple other examples from the Poisson and negative binomial and it's still probably not going to take that long. Hope the dean's office doesn't show up today because they'll think that this is like some sort of fake class for football players or something. <laughs> <laughs> Either Mike Wu made a typo or he has a sense of humor. I did not notice that until you pointed it out. I'm just continuing my philosophy of blame Mike Wu for everything that goes wrong in this class. It's actually unfair because I would be dead in the water without his notes to crib from, but anyway. Multinomial distribution, as I said, this is basically a generalization of the or also in generalization of the binomial distribution, as its name implies, that the binomial distribution, the outcome is 
like a Bernoulli trial, i.e. there's only two possibilities, success and failure. Multinomial distribution is a generalization where there are three or more outcomes. The Say you're doing some sort of drug trial and there's three possible outcomes. It can be a complete failure, it can be like a partial success, or it can be a total success. And say that we know the probabilities of these three outcomes that the probability of a failure is P1, the probability of partial success is P2, probability of full success is P3. Obviously, these three probabilities have to sum to 1. So, and then say you do a sample of size n, well then obviously, then if you let S1 be the number of failures, S2 be the number of partial successes, and S3 be the number of full successes, then the total of S1 plus S2 plus S3 has to add up to n. And so, if you calculate these probabilities and you remember your combinatorics to get S1 failures, S2 partial successes, and S3 successes, well, the probability of a failure is P1, the probability of a partial success is P2, probability of full success is P3, the probability of S1 partial of S1 failures is P1 to the S1, S2 partial successes is P2 to the S2, P3, or S3 successes would be P3 to the S3, so the probability of S1 failures, S2 partial successes, S3 successes would just be P1 to the S1 times P2 to the S2 times P3 to the S3. However, it's the same thing that we had with the binomial distribution. There is many different possible orders here. You could have S1 failures followed by S2 partial successes followed by S3 successes, but the successes could come first or one way or another, the number of orderings, if you remember the one slide that I talked about this in the combinatorics lecture, is just going to be N1 factorial over S1 factorial times S2 factorial and S3 factorial. So those are multinomial probabilities. It's fairly easy to see that if there's only two possible outcomes, then this is identical to the formula for the binomial distribution. So I'm going to think that I think I just already said this, but probability of any ordering resulting in S1 failures, S2 partial successes, and S3 successes is, of course, P1 to the S1 times P2 to the S2 times P3 to the S3. And there's N factorial over S factorial, S2 factorial, S3 factorial possible orderings. So you end up with the total probability just being n factorial over s1 factorial, s2 factorial, s3 factorial times p1 to the s1, p2 to the s2, p3 to the s3. And in general, when you have k different classes, the formula is the approximately the same thing, that you just multiply all the p's by the appropriate power of s, and then take n1 factorial with all the s factorials in the denominator where the total number of successes in n and the sum of the probabilities is 1. And that's really all I have to say about the multinomial distribution. Any questions about this? I mean, it's not going into great detail. I don't think the cell and burger covers the multinomial distribution at all. It's not something that normally gets tons of emphasis in this class, but it is useful in some situations, so it's worth filing away somewhere in the corner of your brain, if nothing else, so that you can Google it if you ever need it someday. Okay, so now we get into the stuff that, wow, yeah, I'd like to believe that Mike Wu is just having fun and that uh, he doesn't, he didn't deliberately, he didn't accidentally put that many S's in Poisson, but I love the fact that I did not notice this at all when I checked my <laughs> slides for typos. But basically these are just some extended examples of the Poisson distribution because I think when Mike organized these lectures he had the same thought that I did that he didn't want to get into exponential families quite yet because they're a pain so but 
three slides on the multinomial distribution isn't enough for an entire lecture, so let's give some more Poisson examples. But if you remember the Poisson from last week, the probability mass function e to the minus lambda times lambda to the s over s factorial, the CDF doesn't have a simple form. You just have to add things together. And the expected value and variance are both equal to lambda. And also, it's pretty easy to do the math to show that if you take the ratio that the probability that x equals i plus 1 over the probability that x equals to i, you end up with lambda divided by whatever the value of i is i is a i plus 1 to be precise. That's why the that's why lambda is referred to as the rate parameter a lot of times. The, the Poisson distribution can be thought of the amount of time until a given event occurs where the event occurs with some sort of fixed rate. And as you see then this tells us that the probability that you go one time unit further, given the number of time units you've already gone, is approximately a factor of lambda. And most applications of the Poisson distribution in real life use this fact that, like I said, an event's happening with a certain rate, and we want to model a process with this type of rate and estimate how many things we expect to observe. So recall the example that I did when we first discussed the Poisson to say there's, we're looking at the rate of pulmonary embolism among, among young women. The rate is about four per million and so we look at the PDF for the number of cases in a city with a million women. But say we have a city that only has 100,000 women, how would the probability distribution change in this case? Well, as you'll recall, to get the rate parameter, you can take the population size, you can take the rate times population. So in this case, the rate is 4 per million, i.e. 4 over a million. So to get our estimate for the rate parameter, we can take 100,000 times 4 per million. We end up with a rate parameter of 0.4. To model the number of cases in the city with 100,000 women, we would expect it to look something like the below based on this formula over here, e to the minus 0 0.4, 0 0.4 to the s over s factorial. Oh, in general, when you're doing this type of Poisson modeling, you can write it as e to the minus lambda time, or e to the minus lambda n times lambda n to the power s over s factorial, where lambda is the rate per unit population and n is the size of the population. So then you end up with lambda times n is the expected number of events, which should agree with our intuition. And population can be in whatever units you want. Lambda is the mean number of events per unit population. So another example, let's say that a computer has a failure of tends to fail once for every hundred hours of use. So let's say you used it for 500 hours. How many failures would you expect and what would the probability distribution be? Well, once again, it would just be 500 times 1 over 1,000, so a rate parameter of 0.5. The expected value of the number of failures would, of course, just be 0.5 the probability distribution would look something like the above, about 60% chance of no failures, 30% chance of one failure, and about a 10% chance of more than one failure. And more generally, if we have time as, uh, as an additional variable in addition to, we have time as an additional variable in addition to population size, 
you can model the distribution as e to the minus lambda t <coughs> times lambda t vs over s factorial where lam lambda is the failure rate per time unit and t is the number of time units. And you can take this a step further and have both n and t in your Poisson model that say you have n computers that are observed for t time units and the failure rate for a single computer for a single time unit is lambda. What would your probability distribution be then? Well, do the same thing that we just did, only put both an n and a t in the equation. You get e to the minus lambda nt times lambda nt to the power s over s factorial. Said so lambda is the rate per per time unit per individual, n is the number of individuals, t is the time frame. Multiply all those together, you get the expected rate. Oh, another example of this, let's say that the incidence rate for childhood leukemia is 3.9 for 100,000 children for children less than four years old. And say that we have 5,000 children observed for 10 years, so what would the probability distribution be assuming a Poisson model? Well, so we take the rate parameter is 3.9 per 100,000 times the population size, in this case 5,000, times the observation period, which is 10 years, get a rate parameter of 1.95. We would expect to observe 1.95 cases of leukemia in this population of 5,000 children observed for 10 years. Distribution function under the Poisson would, of course, be that expression up there. And if we actually calculate the probabilities using that function, it would look something like that. So next example, safety testing of vaccines that, say, a vaccine contains M live virus per cubic centimeter, and you test a sample v cubic centimeters. Well, the expected number of virus in v cubic centimeters is, of course, m times v. The probability that a vaccine tested will be free of a virus, well, the density function, again, assuming a Poisson model, is e to the minus mv times mv to the s over s factorial. The probability that uh, given vaccine will be free of the virus will just be e to the minus mv. And to give specific numbers, if there's 0 0.005 live virus per cubic centimeter and we have a sample of 600 cubic centimeters, then multiply m times v we get 3, so the probability that your Vox sample is virus-free will be e to the minus 3, about 0.05. Oh, one last leukemia example, but say that we observed 15 leukemias over a 19-year period in this one city in Massachusetts. We want to know, is there something unexpected going on here? Is this consistent with what we would expect to observe due to chance? Well, so to calculate this, in this particular city, we, the, they first calculated the number of children in each age range. There were about 2,000 from 0 to 4, another 2,000 from 5 to 9 etc etc and then the I believe the usual leukemia incidence rate per every 10,000 people per year was known from other means I don't know exactly where those numbers came from but one way or another you can get the expected number of leukemia cases over this 19-year period 
by multiplying the population times the, times the expected rate per year times the 19 year period. If you do the math, you end up with this. Add the expected number for each age group together, and you end up with the expected number of leukemias of 0.341 in a population of that size. And so, well, I guess this is the expected number per year, got that wrong, sorry about that. So over a 19 year period, we would expect to observe 19 times 3.41 is about 6.5. So the probability of observing 15 or more leukemias using this formula is about 0 0.007, which is a small number, but not so vanishingly small that you would safely conclude that there's something strange going on here, that this is beyond the co course of 660, but just the applied statistician in me said, so if I saw a result like that, the first question I would ask is like, well, how many of these cities did you look at before you found this one that had an unusual number of leukemias? If you just did this study in Woburn and didn't look at any other cities, then you might go, huh, that's a little funny. On the other hand, if you looked at every city in Massachusetts or every city in New England or the entire United States, and one particular city happened to give you a p-value of a little less than 0.01, and I'm probably saying, yeah, that's about as many p-values that small as you would expect to observe if you were doing hundreds or thousands of different tasks. So, anyway. And... Yeah, technically, I mean, the Poisson, nothing has an exact Poisson distribution other than maybe like a computer simulation designed to have a Poisson distribution. Any type of statistical mathematical model is going to be just an approximation. And I mean, under certain assumptions, the Poisson model is a fairly good model, but it's not going to be a perfect model. And in most cases, hopefully, if you've designed your computer system with any type of rationality, the probability of all your computers failing simultaneously is going to be such a vanishingly small number, such that if your Poisson model says the probability of n plus 1 computers failing is 10 to the minus 30 rather than 0, well, who cares? But... The one quick note on the previous example, that if you look at the previous slide, the rate, the expected leukemia rate is different for children of different ages. So what I did is I just calculated the expected number for all ages, added them together to get the expected number across all the ages and modeled that using a Poisson. You might say, whoa, hold on here. Now, is that really legal to do? Because this is really a Poisson, 0 to 4 is a Poisson with one specific lambda, and 5 to 9 is a Poisson with another lambda, 10 to the 14 is a different Poisson with another lambda, you're just adding all those Poissons together, and then you added their lambdas together. Now that's nice, but is that really legal to do? Well, as it turns out, yes, that if x1 and x2 are independent Poisson random variables with parameters lambda 1 and lambda 2, then you can show that if you add them together, that's just another Poisson with, that's just another Poisson with rate parameter lambda 1 plus lambda 2. We'll go prove this in a couple weeks when we consider like sums of random variables and things like that, but that's just an aside so that you're ready for this when it comes and you see that I'm not trying to pull a fast one on you.
Um, and that's basically all the additional Poisson or Poisson problems. Any other questions about any of this? Okay, well, now a couple quick negative binomial problems. That, as you recall, the negative binomial distribution is when you when you want to predict the probability that you have to go <clears throat> you have to go n trials before you get s successes well then why would have negative binomial distribution with parameter p and number of successes s call a sample space goes from s s plus 1 s plus 2 up to infinity because there always has to be a minimum of s trials but, in theory, you could have infinitely many trials before you stop. Probability mass function is y minus 1, choose s minus 1, the number of possible orderings for the s minus 1 successes in the, y, in the first y minus 1 trials, times p to the s, probability of x, s successes, times q to the y minus s, probability of y minus s failures. Um, yeah, I think I basically just said all that. No simple form for the CDF. You just have to add stuff together. The expected value is S over P. The variance is S times 1 minus P over P squared. And the negative binomial is always the sum of S independent geometric random variable parameter P, which you can use to deduce these results. So... Sports example, and I gave me, I guess I should explain this because this may not be obvious to international students in the room or even American students who don't pay attention to sports. One thing I learned from those car poker examples is that outside of the U.S., many people have no idea what various poker hands are worth, and I probably got more questions about that than I have about anything in this class. But this is not too complicated, even if you know anything about baseball, but like, in the World Series in the United States, or most baseball playoff series, the idea is that the best team can sometimes lose a single game against an opponent. So rather than playing a single game, they just say, we'll play up to seven times. The first team to win four games wins. The idea is that the probability that the better team is the first to win four games is greater than the probability that they win a single game. So the basic idea is that they play at least four games. If the Red Sox win all four of these games, then the series is over and the Red Sox win. If, say, the Red Sox win the first three games, the Braves win the fourth game, then the series keeps going to a fifth game. If the Red Sox win that game, then the series is over. The Braves win, then they play another game. Until one of the teams finally wins seven games, then it's the end of the series. So let's say each game is independent of one another, and the probability the Red Sox win a game is P. So what's the probability that the Red Sox win the World Series? Well, if you think about it, this is just a couple different possible negative binomial random variables. There's four different ways that the Red Sox can win the World Series. One is that the Red Sox just win the first four games. The probability of that happening is just P to the fourth power, obviously. The other possibility is the Red Sox win after five games, but the probability of those events is obviously p to the fourth times one minus p. p to the fourth, the probability of the Red Sox winning four games. One minus p is the probability of the Braves winning one game. But here, there's a couple different possible orderings. You could have Braves win game one, Red Sox win the next four games. You could have Red Sox win game one, Braves win game two, Red Sox win the next three games. All in all, there's Red Sox have to win game five, that's given. For the first four games, there's going to be three Red Sox wins, one Braves wins, the number of possible orderings, of course, four, two, three. 
And likewise, Red Sox win in six games, Red Sox win in seven games in each case. It's just a negative, recognizes the formula for the negative binomial, p to the fourth times one minus p squared, p to the fourth times one minus p cubed, times the number of possible ordering of five, two, three, or six, two, three. So if you know the probability of the Red Sox winning any particular game, you can figure out the probability that they win the World Series. Let's say we want to find the probability that the, the, the series goes to seven games, that of the first six games, the Red Sox win three and the Braves win three. doesn't matter who wins the seventh game. Well, there's two ways this can happen. One is you have three Braves wins, three Red Sox wins, followed by a Red Sox win. And the probability of that is, of course, P to the fourth is the probability of four Red, four Red Sox wins. One minus P cubed is the probability of three Braves wins possible orderings for the first six games of six Q three. Um, mm -hmm. We're still assuming that the Red Sox is winning, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here it's the probability that the Braves win in seven games, which is almost the same, except here we have three Red Sox wins, P cube times four Braves wins, one minus P to the fourth, and once again, six Q three possible orderings. So the total probability will be just 6 choose 3 times p to the 4th times 1 minus p cubed plus p cubed times 1 minus p to the 4th. And I don't know how to like stare at that because that's simplifying on it anyway. It doesn't matter. But no little aside that if you think about this, this is actually equivalent to a problem on the midterm. Um, not the red ball, white ball one, actually the popcorn one. If you just think of like three pieces of pop or four pieces of popcorn in the pockets of both teams, it's exactly equivalent to this. So if you got an answer similar to this, then you should be happy. If you didn't, then better luck next time, I guess. <laughs> But anyway, so that's all I've got on the negative binomial distribution. Um, any questions about that? I'm almost done. I just have a couple of concluding comments here. But so one of the things that you would want to know in this class is understanding the dif distributions and when you should use them. The I mean, I tried to do that on the midterm already, and you're probably likely to see this again on qualifying exams, that the whole idea of saying, okay, this is a negative binomial distribution with these parameters, compute the probability. Well, if you have anything on your formula page, that's not a difficult problem. But when I give some convoluted thing involving <clears throat> bags of popcorn and stuff like that, it may be harder to sit there and say, okay, wait, now here's some place where the negative binomial will be useful. So, and I mean, I wish I had some sort of magic way to learn that, but it may be just one of those things that you need to practice a lot. But if, particularly if you're an MS student and want to pass your qualifying exams, make sure you know this stuff. And in particular, you want to know these distributions as well as what happens when you do simple transformations. If you scale an exponential or add two Poissons together, what happens to that stuff? These, they do come in handy in real life, don't get me wrong, but like there are so many MS qualifying exam problems where they do some obscure thing where adding given distributions together or stuff like that, you really want to know this. So you also want to know what happens if you have multiple random variables, what happens if you transform them, add them together, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. As I said, there's still more time than I thought it would take, but we're well under time. Does anybody have questions about any of this?
And I guess I could pose a final question before we leave. The Tuesday, I will have the midterms graded come hell or high water. Um, would it be helpful to spend some time going through the midterm and explaining how to answer questions? I mean, I'll post solutions regardless, but it's like we're, uh, I'm already about a week and a half, two weeks ahead of where Mike Wu was when he taught this stuff, despite the fact that I was gone for a week. And I'm not sure I want to inflict exponential families on you right before fall, fall break anyway. So if you wanted to spend Tuesday doing questions about the midterm, that's fine with me. So I mean, maybe like if you see things that a lot of people got wrong, Oh yeah, that was kind of my plan, that okay. uh, I can already see the most common mistakes right. and was at least going to highlight those and bring them to people's attention. Yeah. That, like, question one, for example, two is a prime number, but one is not. That was far and away the most common mistake <laughs> of parts A, B, and C of question one. If that's the biggest mistake we make this semester, we are winning. <laughs> <laughs> Just let me stop the reporting real fast. The sigma field generated by A, yeah. This is taking forever to stop this reporting. Come on, quick time. You know you want to stop reporting.